After a gasping, wheezing, rattling swoon dating back to roughly December 2007, which ended with a wretched crumple last spring, there are some signs that the American economy has a pulse, a faint pulse, but a pulse nonetheless. Alert your serotonin levels. There is actually some moderately good news about to be described on primetime cable. Job losses have slowed. Unemployment took a break from rising last month, though it's still at a ridiculously high 10%. The stock market is doing better. Look at how low the Dow was last spring, and look where it's now, hovering above 10,000. People have a little more money in their pockets. The net worth of U.S. households actually rose 5% last quarter. And there's more. Stuff like growth in the overall GDP, wholesale trade, manufacturing, capacity utilization of factories, all up. Moderately up, but still, moderately up is better than plunging off a cliff tied to an anvil, which is where we were. Do you want to know what's still down, though? Loans. Banks still aren't loaning anyone any money. The banking industry has reduced lending for five quarters in a row now, even after getting a giant cash infusion from taxpayers to the tune of, oh, say, $245 billion. So thanks to the bailouts, the banks got their money, got their balance sheets back in the black. They managed to pay back their loans. They're estimated to be paying about $30 billion in compensation and bonuses this year. But still no sign of the loans the rest of us were supposed to get, the ones that were supposed to keep, you know, business businesses afloat and regular people employed. America's banks received extraordinary assistance from American taxpayers to rebuild their industry. We expect them to explore every responsible way to help get our economy moving again. After top bankers left a meeting with the president yesterday, they made lots of rosy promises to jumpstart lending again. What we're all left wondering is... A, whether they'll keep those promises about loaning people money again, and B, whether the president also got a promise from them to call off their army of lobbyists, armed to the teeth, to stop new regulations for Wall Street, new regulations that just passed the House. Joining us now is Congressman Barney Frank, Democrat of Massachusetts. He's chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, which shepherded a sweeping overhaul of the nation's financial regulatory system through the House on Friday. Mr. Chairman, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Richard. Um, what about these promises from the banks that they will start lending more? Do you believe them? I'm very skeptical. Um, I, you know, they also told the president that, uh, uh, gee, they were really surprised to find out that their lobbyists, whom they're paying a significant amount of money, were actually fighting us every step of the way. Um, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not skeptical about it. I just am lying. I mean, the notion, because uh, I've been in a death struggle with these people for, for a month, and it turned out the bosses didn't know what they were doing. Um, I do want to make one distinction, by the way. The community banks, the small banks, who on the whole didn't get the TARP money, um, many of them are willing to lend. We have a separate problem there. I've been told in many places I travel around and try to meet with the local bankers, the community bankers, um, and they didn't get involved in these exotic uh, financial instruments and didn't cause the problem, and they didn't, on the whole, make the bad subprime loans. They have been told by some of the bank examiners who work for the federal regulators to be careful, and I think the problem is the culture of the bank examiners. In the history of the world, nobody who works for the FDIC or the control of the currency has ever been yelled at for a loan that should have been made and wasn't. <laughs> All the abuse came from loans that were made that shouldn't have been. And we have been pressing the regulators to say, look, don't overreact. We, we do want more loans. Uh, the top people, though, they... Uh, look, that's part of what we try to do in the regulations that you just uh, described. Uh, we want to get them out of some of the exotic things they've been doing. For instance, uh, Paul Volcker, a very distinguished, fairly conservative guy, urged us to stop the big banks from proprietary trading, that is, swapping these instruments on their own account. They don't make money by making loans and getting the interest on the loans. They make money by the financial manipulation. We've empowered the regulators to make them stop it. Uh, we have tried to cut back on what they make from derivative trading by putting them on exchanges where the price will go down. So the, the, the short answer is the big banks have found a lot of other ways to make money and haven't been making loans. The small banks, some of them have been willing to make loans and have been restricted. Uh, so the answer to your question, again, is I'm very skeptical. There has been, of course, criticism from the left that in regulations, some of the big banks are going to be getting a lot of what they want, like the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, which seems great. A lot of institutions exempt from oversight. Not the big banks. Here's, here's the way that works. The, nobody will be exempt from the rules they write. They write rules for every bank, or every, and not just banks, by the way, payday lenders and a lot of the non-banks that have been pumped. Secondly, so everybody's covered by the rules, and everybody who has a complaint about any bank goes to them. When it comes to the ongoing examination, 
banks with ten billion dollars in assets or less are not regulated, are not going to be examined by the consumer agency. But the big banks, banks over ten billion, will be. And by the way, people have noted yes, when you exempt the banks under ten billion, you exempt ninety eight percent of the banks, but twenty percent of the assets. The banks above ten billion have eighty percent of the assets. So eighty percent of the bank assets and all of the big banks will fully get the full impact of the consumer agency. What about the worry that the derivatives market? There's great opportunity to finally regulate the derivatives market, which has been so it's been sort of the wild west for so long. Are there loopholes in the derivative regulations, or are we actually going to get well, those? Well, not loopholes. Here's the intellectual and political problem we raise. There are two types of people who use derivatives. There are the financial entities, the banks and the investment houses who make money off them. Yeah. They, if they are involved between themselves, have to go on an exchange and trade it in a fully public way. Then we have the end users, the airlines, farmers, uh, John Deere, Boeing, people who use the derivatives legitimately to control for commercial risk. We wanted to push them all onto exchanges, to be honest. That's what I hope. They had enough political support to say we're nervous about that. So if you are legitimately hedging for a commercial risk, you have to make it public and you have to make the price case. So there'll be no more of the darkness. But you don't have to go on an exchange. The key point, though, is this. And this is where a loophole would come in. Who decides what's what? And under our bill, the Securities and Exchange Commission or the Commodity Futures Trading Commission are the ones who decide it. So we think that's the way. In other words, yes, if you are Boeing or, and you are saying, look, I'm, I'm not trying to make money off this. I just want to control for volatility in currency, mm -hmm. and I'm hedging, but only for that reason, and I'm not putting anybody at risk. If the CFTC or the SEC finds that that's true, you're out. But for the financial entities, they would be covered. Is there any chance that the bill gets stronger in the Senate, or does the bill definitely get weakened in the Senate because of the banking industry and others? Well, the them? banking industry and, the, and you know, the, this terrible de facto amendment of the U.S. Constitution that says you need 60 votes instead of 51. It's terribly any Democratic with a small d. I worry about that. Senator Dodd is really trying very hard, and he's been unfairly criticized by a lot of people. I think he is, I know he's dedicated uh, to, to, to fixing this. Um, and uh, at any rate, when we go into conference, uh, what I'm confident is we'll be able to work this out, and then it's an up or down vote. Although, I got to say, uh, you know, no Republican voted for any of this. Yeah. And when the Republicans got to make their key motion, the motion to recommit, which is the last effort to it. They offered a motion which said we're going to take back all the TARP money, which bothered me because now we're trying to get the TARP money to the unemployed to help them pay mortgages and to small banks. They had zero regulation. In the final bill they offered, there was nothing about any form of regulation. Their position is, please stop picking on big banks. <laughs> Congressman Barney Frank, uh, the chairman of the Banking Committee in the House, uh, who's had a very busy year. Thank you for coming Thank in. Thank you, nice to see you, Great sir. to see you.